Please be seated. St. Augustine said, before God can deliver us, we must undeceive ourselves. And so we come to God asking for forgiveness of our sins, saying that we are willing to change, and that is called repentance. Someone once said, repentance is not blubbering or self-loathing, it is insight. Let us honestly confess our sins before God as we pray together the prayer of confession. Forgive us, O God, for timid faith and reluctant discipleship. You have been at work in us, seeking to stir faithfulness in us, but we have been more concerned with our own comfort than with your kingdom. You have called us by name and had work for us to do but we have chosen to chart our own course. Be patient with us, O God. Summon us away from our own pursuits that we might take up your work and in so doing, find our sense of purpose. By the grace of Jesus Christ, set us free from all that distracts us that we might seek only and always to serve you to the glory of your name. Peter was sinking, he cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, Why do you doubt, you of little faith? That hand of salvation is extended to any person of faith who believes and repents and asks for forgiveness from the author of salvation. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is the call of Abram, which is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Sechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. 
Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading today comes from Matthew's record of the gospel from the 14th chapter. Our reading begins at the 22nd verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. But they cried out, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for this, your word to us, and we give you thanks that it points us to your living word, Jesus Christ. As we gather around these ancient texts this day, by the power of your spirit, make these texts become a living word for us a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, that we might walk where you would have us walk and serve how you would have us serve. Bless us each with the gift of your spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was the summer of 1965, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I was seven years old. If you are very good at math, you know that a seven-year-old in 1965 is 46 in the year 2004. And so now you know how old I am today. This is a concern for some of you. For some of you think a 46-year-old is much too young to have anything much to say. Some of you think a 46-year-old is far too old to have anything of interest to say. You're both partially right. But on that particular day in the summer of 1965, I found myself standing atop 
a high diving board. This particular diving board was at the Davy Crockett State Park in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. So there I was on a hot summer afternoon, all of seven years old, standing on a very high diving board, wondering to myself, what have I gotten myself into? To this day, I'm not exactly sure what prompted me to climb the ladder and stand atop that board. I'd never seen a high diving board before, never been on one, but I'd spent that day watching older kids climb the ladder and jump off the diving board, and it looked so exciting. They would run to the end of the board and jump off, some of them screaming with delight, some gripped too much by their fears to scream at all, but they all emerged from the water delighted and delirious and ran to the ladder and climbed again to do it all over again. So the temptation was too great. I, I was tired of watching other people have so much fun, and so I walked quietly over to the ladder. I walked quietly so my mother would not see me. Because <laughs> if she saw me, that would have been the end of that adventure right then. But very quietly, I made my way to the ladder, and when I got there, the line was gone. The other divers and jumpers, the ones who had inspired me, must have found something else to do, for now the ladder was mine. And so I climbed the ladder, a ladder which seemed much taller than from my vantage point beside the pool. But full of seven-year-old determination, which is a powerful force, I continued my climb and finally made it to the summit where I planted both feet squarely on the rough surface of the board. And with all ten of my seven-year-old fingers wrapped around the rail, I moved my feet forward until I came to that place where the end of the diving board met the wide blue yonder. And I stretched my neck as far as gravity and prudence would allow, and I looked down. I shouldn't have looked down. <laughs> because now I didn't want to be there. All of a sudden, this didn't seem nearly as attractive as it had just moments before. And I may have only been seven years old, but I was smart enough to know that I had two choices before me. I had two choices and I decided to walk back to the middle of the diving board to weigh my options. As I saw it, there are two ways to exit a diving board. I could jump or I could climb back down the ladder. I could jump or I could go back down to the ladder, climb down and return to safety. I could jump and experience the thrill of a lifetime, or I could climb down the ladder and put off that thrill for another day. My options were clear. I could take a leap of faith, or I could choose a path that was familiar and safe. What do you think I did? Well, I'll tell you what I did. Drawing on every ounce of courage in this seven-year-old body, I took a deep breath and clenched my teeth. I might have even prayed a prayer or two, and then I marched straight to the end of the diving board, and I climbed down the ladder and went to my mother and said, let's go home. <laughs> It'd be a better story otherwise. <laughs> Faced with what seemed to be a life and death decision, I decided to look back to safety. I decided to take a path that was familiar to me because I knew if I climbed down the ladder, I'd have something to hold on to with my hands and I'd have a place to plant my feet. I couldn't say that about the other choice. That route was unknown to me. It seemed dangerous and threatening and full of so much peril. For I knew as soon as I jumped, I would no longer be in control. 
Sure, everybody else came out of the water smiling and happy, but how did I know I would? No, for me that day it was easier to look back. It was easier for me to trade the joy of jumping for the safety of a climb back down the ladder. I tell you that story so that you will understand what I mean when I say that here I am again, seven years old, and I'm standing on top of a high diving board. And it's a lot higher up here than it looks from down there. And I'm asking the question again. What have I gotten myself into? Because today I find myself looking into that vast unknown we call the future, and I don't know what's out there, and neither do you. And so like a kid on a high diving board, I know that a jump forward is a jump into uncertainty. Like a kid on a high diving board, I know that a jump forward will require that I let go of some of the sources of my security. Like a kid on a diving board, I know that a jump forward is going to be a leap of faith. And I'm old enough to know that leaps of faith don't always seem like the best option. If you don't believe me, ask the people of Israel, the people who had just witnessed that great and awesome battle between God and Pharaoh, the people of Israel who had been set free after generation upon generation of slavery. Before them lay a promised land, a land to call their own, a land given them by God. Before them lay the opportunity for freedom they never knew they'd have. Contrast that to what lay behind them, slavery and tyranny, watching your children grow up knowing they'd never be anything other than slaves. But instead of looking forward in hope, trusting that the God who had delivered them from Egypt could bring them into the promised land, instead of looking forward with excitement and joy, they looked back over their shoulders and said, well, it wasn't the greatest place in the world, but at least we had plenty to eat. With the promised land before them, the former slaves were looking back over their shoulder to a land with absolutely no promise. With the promised land before them, flowing with milk and honey, they looked wistfully to the bread lines of Egypt. Instead of marching with joy to the promised land, they were dragging their feet in the wilderness, telling stories about the good old days. They should have learned something from their ancestor Abraham who walked by faith and not by sight and left his home venturing to an unknown place all because God said, go. Now who could have blamed him if he had ignored the voice of God and stayed put? Abram could have stayed right where he was and no one could have blamed him. The problem is he would have had to spend the rest of his life wondering what might have been. What I want you to remember from all of this is that this tendency within us, this tendency to choose security over faithfulness is what keeps us from experiencing the richness of life that God has for us. Our firm grip on our old sources of security and our old ways of living are barriers to the new life that stretches before the people of God. The people of Israel discovered this as they crossed the river Jordan and made it into that land flowing with milk and honey. Abram discovered this right off the bat as he ventured forth trusting a God who proved trustworthy. I discovered the same thing some years later when I finally flung myself off a high diving board. 
There is an indescribable joy that is available to us as we take leaps of faith. We can't get that joy by hearing other people talk about their leaps. We can't get that joy by imagining taking a leap of faith. We can only know this particular joy as we cast ourselves upon the abundantly sufficient grace of God. In Matthew's Gospel, we see Peter discovered the wonder of a leap of faith when he stepped out of a boat and onto the water, walking toward Jesus. Conventional wisdom would have told Peter to stay in the boat. There's a storm on the sea. At least if you stay in the boat, you have some things you can hold on to. At least if you stay in the boat, you can even put your hand on the rudder and pretend you're in control. With all of that conventional wisdom racing around in his mind, Peter stepped over the side of the boat and began walking toward Jesus. In the face of conventional wisdom, Peter left his security behind and took a leap of faith. And as many times as I've read the story, it has finally occurred to me that the miracle of this story is not that Peter took a step or two on the water. The miracle of the story is that Peter got out of the boat. One of the first things I need to tell you about myself is that I can't walk on water. I don't care what Ed Finley has told you. But believe me in when I tell you that in coming to a new place, in coming here to live among you and to serve alongside you, I have stepped out of the boat. It would have been easier, in all honesty, for me to stay where I was, to, to stay in a place that was very safe and very secure. But I'm here today because I'm confident that God wanted me to take a step forward to a new place, a leap of faith, and to trust that this is where God intends me to be. And so I've traded a known place for a place that is still largely unknown. I've traded a place of great familiarity for a place that is still somewhat mysterious to me. But in the meantime, and this is the best part, I have already experienced that unmistakable joy that comes from knowing that my leap of faith has landed me in the strong hands of God. Many years ago, when I was finishing my first year at Union Seminary, still struggling with the notion of becoming a preacher, I'm a preacher's son and preacher's grandson. I tried awfully hard to get out of the family business. But there I was at the end of my first year of seminary preparing to head to a church in Tarboro, North Carolina of all places to serve as a summer intern. I wasn't sure I wanted to go. I knew I wasn't ready to go. I kept looking for a ladder that I could climb down. A close friend of mine who was a year ahead of me at seminary knew of my anxiety and my doubt and one morning as the summer drew near he pulled me aside and took out his wallet and took out a little white card that he had been carrying for a year because a person a year ahead of him had given it to him and then a year later I turned it over to a first year seminary student and on that plain little card were the words the will of God won't lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. And I think I knew that, but I needed to be reminded of that. The will of God won't lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. And I put that card in my wallet. And I was ready for the summer to begin. But more than that, for the first time, I think, I was ready for my ministry to begin. 
And even though I don't have that card anymore, I am still strengthened by its truth because I believe what it says, and because I believe what it says, I am ready to begin again here with you. Because I believe that God's will would not lead me to a place where God's grace cannot keep me, I am ready and anxious and eager to begin. And even though I have already looked down, I'm going to jump. For I have come to believe that God has led me here and that God will keep me here. And you might as well know right off the bat that one of the main points of my ministry here among you will be to get you to believe the same thing. You probably think you already believe it, but I want you to believe it. That the will of God won't lead you, for the grace of God can't keep you. For it has been my experience that more often than not, God's will points us in directions we might not want to go. It has been my experience that God's will calls us to do things we'd rather not do, to, to give of ourselves more sacrificially when we think we've probably given enough to love more deeply than seems prudent. It has been my experience that God's will calls us to let go of our favorite sources of security so that we can find our security in our relationship with God and God's Son, Jesus Christ. Letting go of one security for another is not the easiest thing to do. but it is the faithful thing to do. And this is fair warning that throughout my ministry here among you, I will again and again and again challenge and invite you to do the faithful thing. I will invite you to jump off the high dive rather than climb down the ladder. I will invite you to step out of the boat rather than clinging to a sinking ship. I will challenge and encourage you to look forward to God's promise rather than looking over your shoulder to any of the slaveries of your past. I will ask you to believe that the will of God won't lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. So that when, like me, you ask yourself, what have I gotten myself into, you will answer, I have gotten myself into the hands of God. And there I have found my greatest joy. So that each of us might take steps of faith trusting in God's grace. That's why I'm here. And for the unique privilege of being here, I thank you. But more than that, I thank God. To his name be all praise, honor, and adoration, now and forever. Amen.
Let us say what we believe, saying together the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are printed in the bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to call your attention to announcements that are in the bulletin as well as to some other items of interest or concern for our church family. In our hospital report, Melba Sparrow remains a patient at Rex following surgery and she hopes to go home today or tomorrow. Beth Sedbury was in Rex this week and went home yesterday. Ed Walters is back at home. He has home health care now. John Stevenson is back at home recuperating from surgery. Sam Burgess and Doug Kamen had heart catheterizations at Rex and are doing well. Jeffrey Morgan recovering at home following heart surgery at Duke. And his mother, Carol Morgan, is still undergoing chemo every other week. Our congregational sympathy is extended to the family of Molly Barnes Nance, who was a former member who died on July the 29th. We would also like to mention to you that the church voicemail is not working properly. Many of you may have called last week and left a message for us, and we may not have gotten that. So if you call again, if you'll write us a note or call again, and make sure that you get a real human being on the phone so that we'll be sure to get those messages from you. We also ask that you remember to sign up for the next church pictorial directory. The goal is that every single one of us will have our picture in the book so that Ed and his family can learn which names go with which faces. The biggest celebration today is welcoming Ed McLeod as pastor head of staff and his family, Jenny, Amy, and Randall. There will be a reception next Sunday at 9.30 in Memorial Hall and an installation service August the 29th at 7 p.m. Next Sunday is also Promotion Sunday, and children and youth will go to their new classes after they have punch or lemonade and a cookie. Please remember all these joys and concerns as we now turn to God for a time of prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, we give you thanks and praise for your abundant blessings to us. Especially today, we thank you for the beauty of your world for trees and flowers, beaches and mountains, sunshine and showers. We thank you for your many gifts to us and praise your name, for you alone are holy. We especially thank you today for the hard work of the pastor nominating committee that brought Ed McLeod to us. We thank you for your action in Ed's life that called him into ministry and prepared him for leadership here. We pray your blessing on the people and church of First Presbyterian Sumter, the church he left behind, as they begin the next phase in their ministry. And we pray your blessing upon Ed and his family as they make a new life and home here. May they feel the strong assurance of your presence with them in all they do, and may they feel our support and encouragement. Generous and loving God, we thank you for the special people in our lives, for those who love and nurture us, those who teach and guide us, those who keep us safe and secure. We pray especially this day for teachers, counselors, and educational leaders as they begin another school year. And we pray for students that they might have open minds and caring hearts. We pray also for our nation and our political and military leaders Guide them with wisdom and patience as they work for peace, justice, and freedom for all. We thank you, great God, for your presence with us in all the times of life, 
but especially in times of transition and change. Help us to trust in you that you may calm our fears. Help us in the midst of the storms of life, times of illness, stress, and loss, to keep our eyes on you, that we may remain strong and sure. For we make this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before I welcome you, let me first say how grateful the McLeod family is for the way you have welcomed us into this community as we have begun to make this our new home. Uh, I did not uh, ask for their approval beforehand, but I'm going to ask my family to stand up. Uh, Jenny, Randall, and Amy. Amy's already given me a look. That, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, once you meet them, uh, you'll be less impressed by me. Uh, but uh, I just wanted you to begin uh, putting names and faces. Which Thank you all. I appreciate that. I'll hear about that later. Um, <laughs> But uh, as you start putting our names and faces together, we are beginning the, uh, uh, the challenge of putting names and faces in a, the pictorial directory will be a big help. It will also be a help if you continue to introduce yourselves to us, even after the point you, that you think uh, I should certainly be smart enough to remember your names. Uh, don't give me the benefit of the doubt. Introduce yourself again um, until it becomes obvious. But we will be working hard on that and uh, are, great, are looking forward to getting, getting to know you. The staff here has been very generous and kind to welcome me as yet. They haven't even suggested that I'm the one that messed up the voicemail, and I don't think I am, but, um, um, but there are a lot of buttons on that phone. I certainly could have, uh, could have done that, but uh, not even the hint of accu accusation from the rest of the staff, which I appreciate. But now let me welcome you to this time of worship. We're uh, grateful that you're here, whether you're a member of the church or a visitor of the church, the friendship pads are available for you to sign and that way you can know who it is worshiping alongside you. It also gives us a good way to know uh, who has been in worship. And if there are those of you visiting here today who are looking for a church home, a place to call home, a place where you can live out your discipleship, we hope that you have found it here. There's information in the bulletin about inquirers classes or, and uh, just speak to any of us about uh, how to go about uh, becoming a member of First Presbyterian Church. We would welcome you into our family. Someone asked me, a couple people asked me if I was nervous about today. I haven't been really nervous because I knew the pulpit nominating committee was nervous enough for all of us. Um, uh, I think I, I can speak for them and for myself. Uh, we're glad that this portion of the day is, um, is, is behind us. We were, I think we were all a little anxious about uh, that first sermon, but um, now we'll start thinking about the second one. <laughs> Let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings.
us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, you have so richly blessed us, and so we come here today to respond to that blessing. We offer these gifts, we offer our whole selves, heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love you and serve you, and seek to bear witness to your gospel as we live in this world, bearing witness to the saving grace of Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we gather and pray. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.